I'm not gonna walk off this stage and I say how I fucking feel tonight because this house does not deserve to go home tonight. It's houses that didn't do shit tonight. And y'all gave them a perfect fucking score. You okay when we live for you? But we're not living for you? You got an attitude. At the end of the day, he both rings around her, period. What, what y'all getting up here and doing? Do y'all want $100,000 or not? And I did not feel like you wanted $100,000. No. So when it looked like you won $100,000, bitch, I'm gonna give you the vote for the $100,000. Did you wanna be a legend? A statement, a statement, a star. Did you wanna be a legend? What's up, everyone, and welcome back to The Let Out, a legendary podcast. I'm your host, Michael Street. We're past the halfway mark in the season, and the judges are not having it. This week, Houses participated in the Oval Ball, ushering in an era of opulence. In the first category, each house had to put on a production featuring a voguing element. When I say that Father Arturo Miyaki Mugler did not come to play, they did not come to play. The second category was hands performance, which is all about your hands and your arms. It's about telling a story and making shapes and interpreting the music in truly beautiful ways. On Legendary, that was done only through utilizing your silhouette, which made it all the more interesting. At the end of the night, the House of Miyaki Mugler ended up with the Superior House Trophy. Sadly, it was the House of Tishi that went home. Here today, we have with us the two people that we thought we wouldn't see until the very end. Mother Gia Tishi and Simone Tishi to talk about their tense exit and how they became perfectionists at their craft. This is why we came to Legendary. It's Tishi Do! It's Tishi Do! Oh, it's Tishi Do! It's Tishi Do! It's Tishi Do! Woo woo! Bob! Hey, Gia, how are you? Hey there, I'm good. How about yourself? Good, good. What's up, Simone? How are you? Hey, hey, hey now. I'm great. Good, good. So I want to jump right in. We are seven episodes into Legendary and you guys were getting Superior House Trophy, honestly, week after week. And now you're here after, you know, one week. And so I, I, I would love to hear specifically from Gia, um, you know, what was going through your head, you know, in this final episode as, as everything was unfolding. Honestly, I was so shocked, especially because like it, it, it really hit me in the blind side. You know, because mm-hmm. we had been so successful this whole show and we had honestly been, you know, one of the houses to be, as everyone would say. For sure. Um, It was really shocking. Like, oh, my God, this is really fucking happening, you guys, like right now. So, yeah, I was just can't say it again, like how shocked we were for sure. And Simone, obviously, your exit was a little bit tense um and so (laughs) and so you know what was going through your head sort of at that moment as well and and how do you feel about it now sort of in hindsight well set it off was going through my head honestly but um (laughs) but i'll say this like i'm definitely in a different space now and like i said um everything i said i meant no shade but um I just, I guess it was so many different emotions at that point. And I felt like originally I wasn't going to say anything because like, I'm, that's what I do. I'll just walk away to prevent myself from setting it off. But when they asked me to speak, I said, okay, you want me to speak? I'll speak. So (laughs) yeah, that's how I kind of was in that. And I just felt like, you know, I had to keep it real at that point because like, if you think about it, it's like, I know I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Yeah. Um, I may have been the only one to actually speak about it or kept it real, you know, but I felt like at that moment it was, I mean, if I'm leaving, bitch, I might as well leave with a bang. You feel me? So, <laughs> yeah, I had to let the girls know. No shade. 
as I mentioned before, you guys had an amazing trajectory on the show. Gia, did you have a favorite performance sort of looking back o- over every week? Honestly, like for now, I can say my favorite. Um, even going like through every week, my favorite was was week one. And I think it was mm. just because the way we showcase so much so fast, the way we connect, the way everybody was so in sync. It's just like, I just, every time I watch it, I'm like, I love it every single time more and more. Like I find something else that I love about it and it just makes me love it even more. So for me, I think right now it has to be the Grand March production for sure. Can you talk to me about this look, the look that you wore for that? Ah. I loved so much. Wow. Um, This look was created, uh, actually he passed away two months ago. So it's a little sensitive just being the fact that I've, I've worked with Rocky for more than five years and it was really unexpected you know what i mean but nonetheless Mm -hmm. that costume was created specifically for this production just being the fact that we wanted to create something that was like totally over the top but i could still kind of move in it (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um i just went to him about it and was like i need something that's ridiculous something that's show-stopping and that's exactly what he came up with and I mean, just watched it again yesterday and tears, tears still just being the fact that it's just like when you when you put something in your head and you you kind of like visualize it yourself and for someone else to create that image and put it in wardrobe, it's just like, uh, uh, it's a really proud, really proud moment. (laughs) Simone, you had quite a few moments on the show through quite a few episodes. I remember specifically in episode three, you had this amazing moment uh, where all the judges sort of like pointed you out. But also, obviously, you won $10,000 for the duck walk in the Moneyball Challenge. And it's actually so funny because I watch your clips all the time. I love your performance. And so every time I think that like, I'm like, oh, this is her element. You do something else. I'm like, okay, maybe that's not like, maybe it's just all elements. Um, But I would love to hear, (laughs) (laughs) I would love to hear like how in the world you got specifically your duck walk to like, you know, what you got it to and what it was like to win $10,000 for just one element. Okay, so winning the Duck Walk Challenge for me was amazing Um, in so many ways. um, I recall in one of our ballroom groups, there was a person, I won't say the bitch name, but she made a comment on her hating my Duck Walk. And um, I just thought that was just like a slap in the face, like, bitch, I just won $10,000. So this is a $10,000 Duck Walk. Yeah, so um, that challenge was amazing to me because I was able to, you know, actually get the battle. And I was ready for that moment, the whole competition, like to actually do one of the categories because I felt like I hadn't did anything at that point. And then like that came up. So it was very cringy. I won't lie. Um, My legs were fucking about to burn out (laughs) because not only was it that day, we had been rehearsing and shooting videos and it's kind of like you don't get time to rest your fucking legs. So at that moment, um, I had on those big clogger type of heels and um, I didn't quite test it out. But um, on stage, they came unloosed and it was like trying to focus on duck walking while Laomi's like down my throat (laughs) and making sure I don't fall at the same time. It was like I was a a challenge my own self, honestly. So, yeah, it was a great, great moment. And I honestly won't lie. That was one of my favorite performances that night because like it just meant so much to me because we got to do one of the the moves that I try to get them to do in the beginning. Been screaming about the whole season. We got to do the worm. We got to do the worm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was like one of my favorite. It's funny because I was looking at when you guys did the duck walk, you do this move that I have seen you do in your clips before where you sort of like slide across the floor, go up and then slide back across. Her yeah, signature. About- her signature. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Her yeah. Signature. And um, let me tell you about that move since you said it. So that move is in memory of one of my best friends that passed away. Her name is Tokyo Mizrahi. So shout out to her. That move was something that we used to do back in the day when I first started um, walking performance. And it was a move that me and her always did that people actually really know us by. So like every time I do it, it just feels like she's right inside of me, you know. So like that move is real special to me. So it's not now I made it my own because she's no longer here. But everybody knows, you know, like when that comes out, they're like, oh, bitch, watch out, watch out. You guys came into the competition with, you know, 
everybody was like a dancer, most professionally trained. And so was that purposeful or, you know, is the house just a bunch of dancers? I know, you know, there's a history of professional dancers in the house, but I want to hear about specifically the, the group that you guys chose to go on the show. Well, strategically, we did kind of build this around artistry and just also our professionalism. You know what I mean? On top of that, we wanted to put together a team that we knew would have pretty good chances of winning. Watching season one, it was uh, really interesting to see some of the houses and how they were really good, but they, there were so many downfalls and a lot of it had to do with, you know, expectation. And a lot of people didn't know what to expect yet, you know? So going into season two, we kind of knew that we needed to have a team where everybody could pretty much be versatile and do everything, especially when it comes to voguing and dancing. <laughs> so that's why we pretty much picked, you know, the, the people that we did so we could put our best foot forward, especially with competing against nine other houses. <laughs> right. Yeah. Simone, I know everyone else was sort of saying they were professionally trained and all that stuff. And you were saying you did street dance before, but I also know, right, that you performed, uh, you know, like with Tiana Taylor and, and, and all that stuff. So can you talk to me a little bit about sort of your background in, in dance as well? Okay, so yeah, I'm a hood bitch, basically. <laughs> um, um, I learned dance from just kind of like visualizing it like I would see stuff I was one of the pop culture type of kids I was always watching videos and shit so I was very inspired by a lot of pop culture especially Aaliyah if anybody knows me I love her so um it started there like just watching videos and just taking moves and that's what kind of pushed me into ballroom when I saw ballroom because I'm like oh my God, they're dancing. And I don't know what the fuck they were doing. I just seen them falling on their backs. I was like, bitch, I'm trying to do that. So <laughs> I, I kind of brought my style from my my background, which is just like dancing outside in projects with the radio with all the girls around the hood and we making up routines until like we actually got a grade at it. So I start actually doing choreography then. That's what kind of like made my style what it is now because like I was able to like pick up on other dance styles like I did go try to take classes I ain't gonna lie like I took ballet once and I was like bitch I don't know how the fuck y'all be doing this <laughs> um but I learned enough you know enough to like okay bitch I can spin around in the circle long enough that's good but yeah I think I just kind of like I, I was always good at catching on the things so like it was kind of it amazing to meet a whole house full of fucking ballerinas and shit. So I'm like, damn, y'all motherfuckers might teach me something. Right. So yeah, that's that's my background. And I think like, I think that's what makes me stand out as well in the house and not only the house, but ballroom. Cause I'm able to like, just use my street style and just be real, be me. You know, it's all gonna be, it's all gonna be she, me. She thinks she Aaliyah, y'all. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I, you know, Obviously, the team that came on the show is a part of Tishi, but can you speak a little bit to sort of how the house started and to the greater, you know, house as well? Uh, I know that you guys mentioned on the show that you were a break off of one of the older iterations of Milan. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Not the new ones. Yeah, not the new ones. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, we are a boutique house. Um, we are an extension of Milan that was started in 2007. Uh, 17, excuse me. And basically the board of directors wanted to just create something as such, um, not just memorable, but more affiliated with the arts and also stemming from things that are based off of love and respect. And when Marcus came to me about, about going to Tishi, I was more enthused because for me, it was something new and not just the house itself, but for me, the family orientation. And that's something that I really look forward to. And I can say like most of my life, I've always felt kind of like, like that oddball out. And here it makes sense for me because we're all kind of like those oddballs. So you put us all together and it's just like a room full of oddballs, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and then also just being the fact that in 2018, I believe I joined the house at the, at the end of 2018. And, and that's for me when I started seeing the house blossom. And, and I think that's what's so interesting is to see Tishi grow, you know, and, and really come to life. And, and now that this show has taken our house to the next level, it's interesting to see like how people are like, interested in coming to the house. Dick Rider. Yeah. I mean, realistically, that's exactly what the fuck they do when they dick rider. <laughs> Period. 
Uh, Gia, I sort of knew of you a little bit from just like my knowledge of ballroom. I knew that you walked the category of runway. And I feel like uh, one of your mothers was Michelle, who was on season one of the show. And what? Actually, she's my sister and one of my best friends. Yes. Oh, okay. I was just going to ask, can you talk to me a little bit about your trajectory in ballroom? Um, like I said, I know you you walk runway and feel like you were an allure before. And... Yes, I was an allure. My ballroom career actually started as a rodeo. I was a rodeo, and then I went from rodeo to allure, allure. I became Mother Garcon, and then Ms. Rahi. And I found my way to Tishi, duh. And you walked a category. What is it like, like walking runway? We don't see it a lot on the show, right? Specifically solo runway. Right, yeah. They have me voguing. My kids had me voguing week after week after week after week. No sitting down, no runway. Um, but for me, runway is just like another way to escape. It's something that I found more interesting than voguing just being the fact that like, uh, it's, to me, it's a little bit more competitive. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. that's what I love about it. Being legendary for the category as well is, is something that I never really thought I would be capable of realistically, especially being considered like a villain or that bitch is just like, okay, I'll take that too. But I love the category, especially because it's something where I can channel like a sense of like a uh, fiery, raged energy, yeah. and I love that. I love because for me, I'm I'm super sweet, I'm super nice, I'm super hospitable. So for you to see that polar opposite side of me is so interesting. I think she's fucking lying. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I mean, we saw a little bit of that on the show with uh, the runway category, right? Which I have seen a lot worse sprays at balls than that. Yeah, <laughs> see, yeah. I've I've actually done. We actually had a hard time getting that Evian water. Shout out to Sagi for getting me that water because I was gonna use Lysol and baby, were they having fits about it? So <laughs> yeah. The last time I saw somebody spray someone's effect, it was like a, it was spray paint. They spray painted the whole effect, like, pink. Shit. And I think they, no, they they won that battle. I can imagine. <laughs> I was wondering, do you have, like, a big moment that sticks out in your mind in your ballroom career, and can you break it down for me? Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite moments was actually just recently posted, but I uh, walked and won the New York Awards Ball in 2007, I believe that was, or no, it was, I think it was like nine or 10, but I actually battled Giselle Extravaganza. She, at the time she was like my idol, like I die. Cause for me, I, I was all, always in love with uh, girls that were also like affiliated with the modeling industry and that were like, kind of like breakout stars. And to me, I was like just obsessed with her on top of her aesthetic. So to walk and beat her, it was just kind of like, oh my God, I'm really that fucking bitch now. Like I just beat Giselle, girl. Like, oh my God. And then the same night I battled uh, Diva Davana. And at the time she was like seven or eight years old. So she was like a little bitty girl. And um, at that time she's like uh, of the year and like the girl to be in New York. And I'm like, what is, she's little, like she's five years old. Like she's a little kid in the ball. It's crazy. But we had it out on the floor. I threw glitter on her. And I mean, I think I tripped. It was, it was just really intense. I thought it was really intense. And for me, that was just like a monumental moment, especially, you know, coming from the West Coast, like we really don't get opportunities to be on the forefront. You know, it's, it's a lot of, um, West Coast, East Coast shade sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. just being the fact that, like, for me to go to New York, and I think I just became an allure at that time, and to, like, walk and win and be all these legends, it was just kind of, like, overwhelming because I just, I personally, I just wanted to get my tens. <laughs> no shade, you know? And and just to, to be put in that forefront at that time, I can't get over it, so can't. So, yeah, that's my favorite moment for sure. One more follow-up question. What was the shadiest moment that you remember having on the runway? Oh, the shadiest. I can't say. 
But I can't tell. I'm trying to think. Let me think. Let me is think. it it's just like that many shady moments or Oh my God. No, it's just like I don't I don't I don't really get shaded. So No no no. I, I mean you shading someone else on the runway. So you did Oh, 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 okay. So my shadiest moment was uh Ovenus Ball here in LA. Uh, me and Fee Garçon mm-hmm. battled, and that's when I used the Bitch Be Gone spray is what I called it at the time. But yeah, it, it was a really great clip because um, they didn't expect me to use the spray. At the time, my uh, house father, George, handed me the spray, and out of nowhere, I just start spraying her. And it's just like an iconic moment because it's like, where did this bitch get this spray bottle from? <laughs> so that, that would have to be for sure my shadiest moment. Right. Simone, you know, we were talking before. I, Like I said, I've watched your clips, but I've always been interested in hearing a little bit about your story in, in Ballroom. And I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about your trajectory. Oh, OK. So I came into Ballroom, as I remember, in 2008. Um, I was introduced to Pony, Pony Zion, that was from America's Best Dance Crew. Mm-hmm. He bought me to Ballroom and I was in the house of Zion, which ended up merging into Jordan Zion. And um, I remember at the time I was walking drag's face. So I I walked face before I evolved. Um, I just thought the category was kind of like cliche, like somebody judging my face. And it's just like, bitch, like, I know I look better than this person. So you're not about to tell me, you know, like, and you know how you have that cocky little feeling. Like, that's how I felt. I was young. So I'm just like, I don't like this because like, I feel like they let, I remember they let this one person beat me and I'm just like, okay, they blind. <laughs> so that was like the last time I walked the category and then um, I remember telling them like I wanted to Vogue and they just was like, no, that's you got to be like this prissy face girl. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I want to fucking Vogue. And they're just like, well, we don't think you should Vogue. So I was like, well, I'm gonna show you. So, bitch, I walked out there and Vogue one night. And Jordan Zion at the time was like a bunch of like amazing Vogueers were at the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a, a name to live up to, honestly. And um, I walked out one night and just went off and everybody was like, oh, wow, this bitch, she do Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I end up leaving their house because they didn't like want me to Vogue. And I remember Pony was making all these comments about it. So I end up um, joining the house of Miss mm-hmm. Rahi as well. And um, I remember that night I won my first ball. I won the mini ball. And I just remember the feeling I had. I was like, bitch, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, like, and it was just the money was fast and easy. So I'm like, okay. So um, I kept voguing. I was a Mizrahi. Then I ended up leaving Mizrahi later on down the years. I stayed in Mizrahi for a while. I ended up leaving and joining the house of Miyaki Mugler. And um, I was ATL mother for a few years. And um, I just decided to part ways with them because I felt like, you know, in ballroom, you learn like, when you are in a family, it's very important to feel like it's family. And it's very important to feel comfortable where you are, never forced. So I end up leaving that home because I feel like all everyone wanted to be a woman, even the guy. So I'm like, well, what the fuck? Where's my place here? You know? So like I end up leaving that house and joining the house of Tishi. And um, that's when, you know, shit took off for me. I feel like that's when I really felt like I was in the right family. And I do know it's very fresh. It's only been like now two years, but um, it's just been the right the right move for me. And my big thing is like, don't let the name make you. So I feel like this shows bitches that bitch, Japan, Simone, whichever one you know, this name is, it, it doesn't matter what name is behind it. I'm going to eat. I'm going to slay. I'm going to serve, honey. Yes. So you mentioned Japan. And so some people know, well, a lot of people, not some people. I think you're the most followed person on the cast. So a lot of people know you online uh, as Japanese faces from the work that you do um, as a makeup artist. And I was wondering if you wanted to chat a little bit about sort of how you got into that um, and whether it intersects with ballroom at all. Very, very, very. So I got into makeup because I'm gonna just keep it real with you because I'm a real bitch. Okay. So I got into makeup, honey. Like I was walking balls and, you know, like in in those days, like you're young and you're hungry and, I told myself and I told God I would never work for man again because it just seemed Mm. unfair. So I was walking balls and winning money, but it still didn't feel like enough. And I was still just like one of them little kids that's just going from house to house and like trying to figure out, you know, her life, like pose basically. So I end up saying, you know, like, bitch, you got to pull it together. And I end up meeting my gay father, which is Darnell Mizrahi. He was just like, you're too beautiful. And he's like, there's got to be something, you know, you, you could do. And I was like, you know what? I do makeup. And like, I never noticed it. Like I was always doing it on myself. And I just knew that people always was like, you're so beautiful. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I never really paid attention to the fact that I was 
doing makeup, you know? Yeah. It was just kind of like something that as a girl, at that time, I was still a girl, but I was, you know, a butch queen. But as, it's something that you naturally have, and you're just like, this is a part of my day. So I end up kind of like um, just saying it. I'm like, well, this is what I need to start doing. So that's how I got into it, because I had to get the funding to build the woman that I was soon to become. And um, I started doing makeup, and it just kind of took off like a wildfire. I remember my first ever client, I remember... At that time, to me, she, um, Carrie Hilson, she gave me a call on the phone. I was in L.A. She was popping back in these days. And I remember she called and I'm like, wait, that's the real Carrie Hilson. She left a message and everything. So she had time. Like she really wanted to see me. And I remember getting that phone call like, oh, I want to work with you. I don't no matter what we do. And then from there and went from Tamar to Karuchi to motherfucking Cardi to Tiana to Kay Michelle, like the, just the amount of fucking celebrities that like just kept swarming and wanting their face done by me and just wanted to be in my presence and just not only half the time not just want their face done they just wanted to know me you know and right. I just thought that was a beautiful thing so it definitely helped out as I can say in the ballroom scene because I built a platform on the outside that got me jobs as far as like going on tour with Tiana Taylor and um being in her videos and being a part of moments you know she's a ballroom girl too right and um she just loves Vogue. So like I was able to teach her some things. She was able to teach me some things. We were able to like create dope moments for a ballroom. And like, those are just some dope ass moments that, that I think like all added into my story. And I feel like coming from where I was, like you had to do this to do this and you had to do this to do that. And you know, like I just always believe in that. Like it's okay. The process is okay. Trust the process. For sure. I remember watching you obviously on the... um the Tiana, like, concert for the Work This Pussy uh, performance. And I was just wondering, like, what was that like to be a part of, of that specifically? You know, I knew that you were doing her makeup, but then I, for some reason, I didn't connect that you would also be on the, on the tour, <laughs> like, dancing for her. Okay, so, so this is crazy. Tiana had been bugging me to dance for her. You know, like, I dance as well. So she would just been like, why don't you just come and fucking learn the choreography and dance? And I always used to be like, you know what? Because I didn't want to overstep my boundaries. I'm like, you know what? I'm doing makeup and I ain't gonna lie, bitch. It was a lot of work. Just kind of having to, you know, like, work around, you know, her schedule. And, you know, Tiana's a diva sometimes. So just having to, like, be always available when she needed me and just, like, imagining trying to learn some fucking choreography. I'm like, bitch, no. So I always kind of shot it down. And then I remember when um, her and Kanye were in the studio and they were coming up with the work this pussy. And I remember I heard the beat. And she was just like, she was like, yeah, bitch, you already know we about to carry. You know, she started doing herself. I was like, <laughs> I said, bitch, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be crazy. So, you know, like it seemed, it seemed unreal because like our stuff is always kind of shunned upon. And like to hear like a star, like just take it and say like, we're going to make this, this going to be on the album. So I'm like, wait, bitch, like a Vogue beat, like and Tiana Taylor on it. So actually that was the first time when I decided to dance for her because she was like, okay, bitch, no, you're going to be in this video. Because she knew my background in ballroom and she's just like, you got a Vogue, like you got a Vogue. So when they came up with their treatment for the video, she wanted me to be a part. So I ended up coming to do the video. And then when we talked about the tour, she's like, we're going on tour. And she was like, she wanted to get other people, but you know how it is. It's hard to keep up with the girls. So yeah. she was just like, no, why get out all them? When I got you, you already do my makeup. I could just pay you to do both. So I was literally on the tour. Like I would do her makeup. I would go rush and do my makeup. Then um, I would get dressed. And then I would, because my part of the show was in the second half. And then I'd right. be running from the um, dressing room to the side of the stage and like literally go out there and work my pussy. So it was a, it was a dope ass moment. I would say it was very overwhelming because like the amount of like, the amount of people that it touched and the amount of people that were there and like the, to hear a fucking crowd of thousands of people just like going crazy when you come out, like, I didn't know the bitches knew me, but I'm like, they was like, ah, so I'm like, damn, like, this is crazy. <laughs> so it's real overwhelming. Yeah. And like each night it felt the same, like it never died down. It was like the momentum just felt the same. It, it was cringy every single time. It was a dope experience. Like I won't, don't trade it for the world. It was amazing. Gia, has Ballroom taught you something about yourself? Ballroom has actually taught me a lot about myself, it's especially now that I'm getting older. You know what I mean? Um, just being so headstrong for sure is like one thing that I've always kind of instilled in myself when it comes to ballroom, just because it's so easy to get walked on and stepped on and overlooked and overshadowed because there's so much great talent. So for sure, being assertive is <laughs> for sure another thing that I've kind of like gotten a grips on within the last, I want to say like two years, especially because being a, a mother figure, sometimes you... 
it, it's not that you don't want your kids to feel like uh, you're misleading or overstepping your boundaries. You just kind of want to give them the opportunity to be able to come to you about anything, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes that comes with being a little bit more um, submissive in a sense, if that makes sense. What is it like the, you know, I don't know much about the West Coast scene. You're, you're West Coast mother, right? Correct. So can you talk to me a little bit about What's it like sort of on the on the West Coast? Everyone talks about New York and, you know, obviously people even are now talking about Atlanta a lot. There's a lot of amazing balls down there. But can you talk to me a little bit about the the scene on the West Coast and in L.A. specifically? Well, the West, the, the West Coast scene is a lot smaller, especially because uh, we have... We have a lot more opportunity with industry bound things like music videos, movies, Mm -hmm. television. So our scene is definitely a lot smaller, but we have a lot of great talent, you know? And and that's I think that's sometimes the our downfall is because our scene is so small that sometimes we almost get forgotten about, you know? And then when it's time to compete, when it's when it's time for the West Coast girls to go back east, it's uh it's definitely some great competition, you know, but it's like easily overshadowed, you know? Um, and that's that's why I appreciate the girls like Simone who come to LA and not only do they come and support, but they come and show out, you know? And, and that's really what it's about, you know, going from coast to coast and just letting the girls know who you are, period. Like she said, it's definitely about you and what you bring and not your last name. Yeah, don't use the last name to make you. And that's what I feel like a lot of the bitches do. Like, oh, I'm a become a, I'm a become a, 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 a Balenciaga. Yeah, because yeah. they going to make me just, uh-uh. uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Simone, has, has Ballroom taught you anything in particular? Yes. Ballroom has taught me to always stay true to myself, for sure. Never um, second guess things that I want to do. Like, do what you want to do. Do what you feel like you represent. Don't let someone come and change you and tell you what you should be to to be sickening or to be the girl. Like, be the girl that you are and don't join a house for the name. Like, actually be in a house where you feel comfortable and make your name. Um, It also has taught me to just, you know, stay to myself. Like, don't become friends with too many bitches because bitches is real weird. Um, you know, just always let a bitch know the first time so you don't have to worry about it the second time. She got her nerve. She a weirdo. <laughs> it sounds, it's, y'all are saying the same thing, you know, to be assertive. Yeah, to be because, assertive. Yeah, because you have to, like, I learned, like, being a pretty girl, like it's sad, and like people really don't know the Simone that they get to see on Legendary because it's like all they saw was the pretty pictures and they, I'm always quiet. I don't let people in my life because I know like bitches just be ready, you know? So like to actually see that they get to see that I'm a real bitch, it's like, it scares them because it's like y'all judged me all this time without even, you know, just come up and say hello or ask yeah. who I am, you know, like instead of doing that, girls just be like, oh, she thinks she this, she thinks she that. No, bitch, you think I'm that. Mm-hmm. You know, I never ever told you that. So yeah. it's like, even in ballroom, when you come out and walk balls, people are already judging you like, oh, like that's Simone and she does makeup and uh, I'm going to chop that bitch just to gag her. You know, like that's what this scene is about. So I feel like you always have to be the bitch to check a bitch right away. Bitch, I'm going to give you your, your fries and your burger the first day, babe. Don't play with me. So this season, I feel, and someone has said previously on the show, or, well, on the podcast, that it's the season of the Femme Queens. They brought the girls out more. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts or opinions about sort of like the importance of including Femme Queens in, in the show. I mean, realistically, like, you know, Ballroom was created from trans women, you know, and I think personally, like ballroom extends from trans women that, you know, that, that those are the creators. And I, th- I think because it's butch queen dominated now, you know, it's, it's kind of like we get forgotten about. Um, but here in season two, just listening to every mother figure's story and their upbringing and how they have triumphed, it's just like, yeah, we need more of that. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's just so beautiful to see all of the ladies get their roses that they deserve because, like I said, I can't I can't express it enough. You know, there are certain specific houses where, you know, the, the butch queens don't even open their doors for the femme queens. They don't hold their bags, you know, and it's just... I'm a glare. <laughs> Sorry. Still, it's like, <laughs> for, for us to be female figures, it, it kind of starts there. And I think that's sometimes the bigger issue is kind of like inflicted on the community. And 
that's something that we should talk about a little bit more, you know, because we deserve as women to be put first, especially because, you know, we started this shit and that's on HBO Max. You know, just for the listeners who might not know, I want to give a little bit of background around what you're saying, which is the story and the history as we know ballroom. It was started by Crystal LaBeja, who we would now know to be a femme queen. Um, You know, she was walking pageants. The girls was being racist and she was being shaded. She decided to stop walking to pageants started her own thing. House of LaBeja started putting on these balls. The balls began to, you know, they continued for a little while. It was mostly femme queens and butch queens came, but they were just watching. And then, you know, as more butch queens came, because there were just more, there's more of them in general. Butch queens. uh, Things began to change in terms of like, you know, the categories and where the focus was. But, you know, not only did the scene itself start from femme queens, but voguing is credited by being started by, you know, like Paris Dupree, who was a femme queen. You know, Mm -hmm. femme queen performance was the original Vogue femme. Like all Vogue femme is based off of specifically femme queen performance. So, you know, everything we're seeing, it goes back to femme queens in that way. So I just wanted to give that that little explanation if, if people were not aware. Um, Simone, do you feel a way in particular about like, you know, the visibility for femme queens within the scene or even on the show specifically? I think the visibility of the femme queens this season was amazing. Like I, I was, it was, a, I, it was exciting for me to see like people like Shannon, people like Stasha, no shade, like they're women who are way before our time and like to see them still be beautiful and still, you know, be able to even move at this point, you know, like the way they were was a beautiful thing. So like they moved. Don't do that. <laughs> no, like, no, to see them, like, on the show and, like, people get to see them in that light, I think that's a beautiful thing. Like, the moment that touched me, really, like, I watched when they, they the Agas did their, like, little confessional and Shannon, like, almost start crying. Like, that, like, I almost shed a tear just watching that because, like, you know, people don't understand the life that we have and, like, the the power that we hold and, like, the boldness that it is to live as a femme queen every day. So, like, no matter what, beyond anything, I think that's a beautiful thing. So I think it was bomb to see so many girls on this season because, you know, the girls is what's going to shake up the room. And I think it needs to be more stuff like that because they, they feel like they have to hide us a lot of the times. And I don't think we need to be hid because y'all girlfriends want to be us. Yeah, they want to dress like us, act like us, talk like us, too. Right. Simone, you said something during the season that really, like, stuck out to me, specifically about trans women being able to show their masculine sides. And I was wondering if you'd be up for chatting a little bit more about that, because I think it's a conversation that as we talk about these issues more and more, that, like, we we need to have these conversations as well, is that, like, you know, there is not one way to to, to be a, a woman. I'm glad you said that, because, like, that was a moment on the show, too, that happened. I mean, Roshannon asked me about it, but... But being a, a trans woman to me isn't trying to hide that you you were something before. And I feel like I think the sad part is like a lot of people, they kind of get afraid of that feeling of people going to say, oh, you're a man or or is this. I mean, honestly, I think everybody should just realize that we we were what we were and we were able to transform into the people that we are now. So I think it's, it needs <laughs> to be respected that like. We were a motherfucking prototype. Like, it's nothing wrong with channeling your masculine side because to me, I just feel like if you own it, like, what can people say? Y'all already saying it anyway. No shade. Like, I don't don't think it's nothing wrong with that. And like I tell bitches, I was sickening when I was a boy too. So like, don't get it twisted. Me transitioning was something I did for my personal self, but I'm never obliged to what I did, like, because I did it. And I feel like it's okay. You know, like, people feel like it's like a, oh, because you are a trans woman, you can't be masculine or you can't, you can't do the same things that you did before, but look this good. Like, it's nothing wrong with it. And I feel like that's why I did that on the show, because even then, you see, I still look good. It doesn't matter. It's really funny because, you know, I don't know if you watch RuPaul's Drag Race, but this season... Um, got Mick competed and he's a trans man who does like this high femme drag. And so he started this conversation on the show and he's been talking a little bit about it in interviews and stuff. 
that like when people see a trans man, they only really want to see this like hyper masculine, you know, you know, whatever, this like muscly, deep voice type of man. That is what they have in their mind. And he was making the point that like, you know, he has all of these gay friends who are really feminine. And and if they can be feminine, then a trans man can be feminine. And so I think it's like important to to have these conversations that like just because you're trans doesn't mean that you have to like you know, restrict yourself to this sort of binary, but you can have all these like various, the, all these variations of, of how you portray yourself. I love that. I feel like the titles is what fucks everything up. I feel like we should just be who we are. Like if we're just who we are, I feel like the world would be so much more different because love is love. And I think that's where people got it fucked up. Everybody thinks like, oh, because I'm a trans woman, I have to be like, oh, sorry you know everything is just you know that's that doesn't mean that like you're you're a prototype when you decided to become a trans woman you made a decision to be the prototype so whatever you make that honestly i'm not going to say it's right to just go out there and be like hey what's up or nothing like that but at the same time if that's you that's you no shade you. what's up bro what's up bro, <laughs> <laughs> up, bro? oh shit i'm wondering what do you guys, and I'll put this to Gia first and then have Simone hop in. What do you guys hope people take from your time from the show, you know, other than the amazing performances? Or if that's just it, that's also fine. Um, I hope I hope that people really get to see us as a family, as a unit. Mm-hmm. That's just something that I like really stressed. Us just being able to like get to know each other on a personal level, especially because like, you know, we all live in different cities. So that was like our real first time, like being together all the time. And I think our our um, organic connection is what is is really like so entertaining to watch, you know, especially like us two together all the time is like a nonstop fucking comedy union. But with the five of us, it was just like, just magic, mm-hmm. you know? So I really hope the world really gets to see our magical moments, you know, outside of slaying a stage. What about you, Simone? I hope, because um, she kind of touched on what I was going to say, but I hope that they get to see the versatility in all of us. Like, mm-hmm. we're all able to do many different things and the sky's the limit from here. I hope they get to see that we're real. We came, we gave it our all for sure. That's what we I definitely want them, did. That's what definitely what I want them to see. And um, I just want them to see that, you know, anybody can do what we did if you just put your, your mind to it. Uh, so I'm going to take a second because I want to talk a little bit about Stanley. I have been such a huge fan of Stanley so long. Um, and I just wanted to sort of hear a little bit about um, what was it like sort of working, obviously having him a part of the house and, and there's that amazing on point moment during the season. But I didn't know if you guys, either one of you had a particularly close relationship with, with Stanley. So when I first met Stanley, and this is because I'm like the new, I'm not the new girl. So when I first met Stanley, it was so funny because like, I'm just like, why doesn't he talk? He's so quiet. Like, and Stanley is so like, like a cat. You would never know he was there because he's just always in his own world. So I always wonder, but he, you could feel the, jing- like I'm an energy person. So he always had good energy. And I'm just like, I just want to know more about him. But it's like, it's not even an option to know. You know, he's just like, hi, I'm Stanley. Like, it's that's it. So like right. during this process, it was fucking amazing to see Stanley come out of his shell. And I remember we had this moment during the quarantine part of the thing. We first got there, like everybody was in their rooms and, you know, us being trans women, the emotions are high because we on hormones. I'm like, bitch, I'm feeling weird Ooh, in here. Lord. Like, it's dark. Help me. I want to come outside. I need some air. Like, I'm depressed. I remember we all got on like a FaceTime call and like we each shared like a moment that, you know, like we went through in life. Like I was telling them some shit about my childhood and then someone else brought up something about their childhood. And I remember everybody was in tears. And then there's Stanley down at the bottom corner that wasn't saying shit. So I'm like, <laughs> it's like weird. Nobody even thought to ask Stanley because like Stanley's just that he's just the flower in the room. Like he's not, he's not, he's just there to soak in. So I'm like, Stanley, what's your story at this point? And then he's like, he's like, okay, you guys. And he just told us everything. And it was just like beautiful to see that part of him. And like, you could tell that he doesn't cry. He cried. And I think that was like one of the moments I will always cherish because it was just like, Stanley, we love you. I love you. I love you even more because I already loved him, but I ended up loving him even more because I just knew it was something there and that he wasn't showing us. And when he actually showed that to us, I think that was one of my favorite moments. 
Well, you guys have seen the houses that are left. I want to hear your thoughts on who you guys think is going home next and who you think is going to go the distance. (laughs) (laughs) Not these last. (laughs) Um, Moni, go. Go. So I feel like a lot of them should have been home. But if we're we're going to speak about it, I definitely think the Garcons, they should have been gone. No shade. Love them down. But I feel like they floated in the competition. I would definitely have to say, I feel like the Agas should have definitely went home. Love Honey down. Shannon's beautiful. Love Kalik. But at the same time, I feel like they kind of like rollerbladed through the competition. Skated. Um, Who else is there? Orichi should have been home um i feel like they were amazing family and i won't lie that's the one thing i loved about them like compared to the families there they were the only ones to me like us that i felt like were a genuine family and they actually really wanted to win but in my mind look i'm not even gonna i'm not even gonna be cocky because i i I haven't seen it but i'm just gonna say this i do feel like they should have been gone home as well and um i will say for the mugler's i was kind of like because I, I ain't gonna lie, I'm a Mugler fan still. You know, th- some of them are still my family and friends. But I was kind of just, like, waiting for a moment, you know, like... And I didn't see that moment to the day we actually left. Like, that was my favorite performance of theirs. Because I'm just like, wow, that's what I was waiting for. Because I, I was confused on what the fuck they was doing the whole time. So I also feel like they should have been gone. You know, like, all the bitches should have been gone. Okay, but wait. Hold up. Wait a minute. You just said all the houses. <laughs> Who was supposed to stay? Should have been... <laughs> We were supposed, supposed to supposed motherfucking to the winners, stay. What you bitch. mean? <laughs> and we need the world to know. It's okay? y'all crazy. Yeah, I exactly. said who was supposed that to go. She named honest. every house. Uh, and I'm in them comments, y'all. I'm in them comments. I just got to keep it real. They were supposed to go. And y'all will be in the comments too. But um, I feel like, and I'm just keeping it real. Love y'all all down. Y'all can meet me outside after this. <laughs> I feel like all y'all should have went home and it's no shame. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I uh, I love Miyaki Mugler so much and I think they have done, I, I think they've done solid. I love, I love almost every member on the team. Me too, though. Me too. Um, but I will agree that their last performance in this episode was so good because it wasn't just like the dancing right like it was like true entertainment which was like what you guys were giving every week right it was like a full storyline and like nuance musicality it was everything i completely agree there did you do you just agree with simone gia or do you have i totally agree with her 100 percent. like her <laughs> and and i think that was that was why i was so quiet when when we leave you know because mm-hmm. it, it was just kind of like she hit the nail on the head and we we technically play good cop, bad cop. So it was okay for her to be the bad cop in that moment. <laughs> no, but I knew it was coming. But you, I tried to avoid it. But I, I I, just I just felt it was very unfair. I'm so sorry. Like, it's, it, at the, I, I would never get past that part. I don't, I don't think it was fair. And I only could say this. Everything happens for a reason. And I'm happy that whoever wins is going to win. But I do feel like if it's anybody who does win, if it wasn't us, it should be the Mugler's because at least I could say they actually do yeah. put they all into everything that they do. May not have worked each time, but I felt like they were actually there to work hard and win. And I feel like everybody else other than that is no shade. Pack the bags. Well, thank you guys so, so, so much. I do hope to make it to Atlanta for a ball and, you know, maybe I'll get to L.A., but I definitely want to get to Atlanta this year. So hopefully we'll be able to meet you both in person. Thank you, too. And you're amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And shout out to the rest of our house members. It's Cici ah! Thank you so much to the professional dolls, Mother Gia Tishi and Simone Tishi, from the house that always gave us true entertainment. But now it's time for my let out moment where I pick the snippet of the show that will be stuck in my head for the foreseeable future. As you all heard last week, I'm a massive fan of The Sound of Ballroom. I listen to tracks from the scene on SoundCloud at the gym while I'm working and basically anywhere I'm existing. But hearing Honey Balenciaga on the production this week was really something else. I loved it so much, in fact, that I gossiped about it with Deshaun after our interview last week. Here's our take. And then the clip. It's actually so funny because the whole time I was thinking about Honey commentating on 
this on the this yes she did comment i forgot i forgot i thought it was so good literally she when we was on stage she's like you got you got your life on my conversation i was like that was you i was living it was good it was so good this is boring it's time to overthrow the queen bitch i'm back and ready to attack i'm like The Let Out is produced by HBO Max in partnership with Spoke Media. Just a heads up, episode 8 of Legendary is waiting for you on HBO Max, so if you're listening to us there, go right ahead. If you need a minute, we'll be dropping our next episode in your podcast feed in a few days. Make sure to stream episodes of Legendary and The Let Out on HBO Max. And tell us all your thoughts about the departure of the House of Tishi over at Legendary Max on Instagram. I'm your host, Michael Street. You can find me at Michael Street on Instagram. For Spoke Media, our producers are Kelly Kauf and Ariel Mejia, with help from Hebron Mendez, Alicia Force, Brigham Mosley, Janielle Kastner, and myself. Original music and sound design by Evan Arnett. Special thanks to Clay Kim. Executive producers are Aliyah Tavakolian and Keith Reynolds. See you next time.